about um, what happened when we actually ran proc mixed on this data set, and then we'll, we'll look at some of the results. Uh, well, one thing we did was we considered, um, we, me, marginal repeated re measures models, in other words, G equals zero, no G matrix, transitional models, or, although uh, transitional models, um, questionable, uh, that has to do with conditional models, uh, but we did consider uh, a one f way to do a conditional model that um, has questions about it, where you actually just forget about using an earlier response and just assume the model, the uh, marginal, that you have a marginal model and that you're running AR1. AR1 stands for autoregressive. Uh, and then also did some random effects models. Now it turned out for the complete data, I'm just saying what they said, the estimated regression coefficients were the same regardless of how R, the, the um, R matrix varied, but the standard errors were different for different R. Now, I don't know if you understand what I'm saying here. Right? In fact, I should probably show you this. Uh, I'm not going to show you here. I'm going to show you, okay, here, look at this. Um, now, I did say FEV estimates without the empirical option. What do I mean by that? I haven't said anything about it today. Did I say anything about it earlier? Well, you remember, um, you may remember, that uh, when you run a model, whether it's proc mixed or something, you have to specify a correlation structure, like exchangeable uh, or autoregressive or so on. And one thing you're never hardly ever sure about is whether you got, you specified the right structure, right? Did you really, you said exchangeable, is it really exchangeable? You said unstructured, is it really unstructured? Uh, so um, when you do that and run proc mixed with just running it without doing anything special in terms of what you tell the, compu the computer, what you tell the program, you're basically not adjusting for the fact that you may have um, misspecified the correlation structure. Another way of saying that is you're not using a way to adjust, and the way to adjust is called the empirical option. So if you haven't adjusted, you're, you're, go, you're not doing the, you're not using your, you're doing, you're getting your estimates without the empirical option. So that's the results without the empirical option. And but you can also use the empirical option. The reason for, for using the empirical option is what? Why do you use the empirical option? The reason is because perhaps you can adjust for the fact that you might have used the wrong correlation structure and still get a result that allows you to sort of reflect that, you know, take in, that into account. Uh, and that's something that a lot of people often want to use because if they're, they rarely they rarely assume that they know the correlation structures. The empirical option is usually used, but you can also do it without the empirical option. Now, what I'm showing you on this screen is the results for um, one, two, three, four different runs, where it says ri sim. This is another way of saying ri simple or sigma square i. In other words, this is. Um, what I used here was an independent R matrix and no G matrix. This is a compound symmetric R matrix, no G matrix. This is an AR1 R matrix, no G matrix. This is unstructured, no G matrix. Now here are the results, okay? This is just listed over here. And you notice um, um, for each result, I've got F statistics, okay? Wh what do you think the F statistics are testing? What are the F statistics testing? Well, you remember, there were two, two main questions. One question is whether over the five weeks, whether the average FEV score over the five weeks was different over the five weeks. Week one, week two, week three, week four, week five, whether there's a significant difference. And we couldn't assume necessarily that they were independent, although this one does. But these, these other three don't, OK? Now, this, these F tests, when you, do, when you use proc mixed, you're getting F tests. Uh, 
the reason why you're getting F tests is because you're doing, um, uh, you're assuming normality, basically, multivariate normality, and that's why it's F test, okay? Um, although you're, you're still dealing with the sample size that you have, which is 40 and not 2,000 or something like that, so you still have to use F and T tests and not Z tests to do this. But you notice that the F, the, the F statistic for these four different things are different. So what does that say? What does that say? That says, depending upon what correlation structure I used, I'm getting different results about whether, uh, how much significance I have, whether the five FEV averages are significantly different. But you notice that all five results are highly significant, right? So it doesn't seem to really matter what correlation, and this is one of the things I said, it may be that if you're doing correlation analysis and you have a particular question, if, you're que if your only question was is the five FEV scores, uh, average FEV scores the same over the, over, the, over the five weeks, then it doesn't really matter what correlation structure, you're gonna have the same conclusion. Yes, it matters, right? Because you're getting significance no matter what you do, okay? And you don't necessarily really care about the correlation structure, although you can get that. You can estimate the correlation structure. Now, notice that if you look at the um, parameter column, it's got intercept, week one, two, three, and four, okay? So the model that's being used is the model that I talked about in the previous lecture recording, the model that has four dummy variables for the five weeks, four dummy variables for the five weeks, has an intercept, and it doesn't have any other variable in it. I, I, when I originally wrote the model down in my original um, uh, uh, specification of the model, I had a couple of other variables, sex and race, but there's no sex race variables in this data set. So I'm only modeling um, the outcome FEV on what happens over the five weeks, okay? So um, what, what I wanna, so if I actually, Look at the 24.50 uh, here, for example, or the 55.2. I'm testing whether the average values over the five weeks are, different, are, are significantly different. So what I'm not doing is I'm not doing something about how week one differs from the other four weeks on the average. I'm just, at this point, I'm just showing you what happens to the, for, for the first test, for the first question, okay? Now notice that, um, Again, uh, this is the model. In this particular model, the reference group, the class variable was, um, was weak, and so the reference group was week five. Okay, reference group was week five. Okay, now let me ask you this. If the reference group was week five, and I asked you, given this model, what's the estimate of the average, um, what, what I should say, the average, uh, FEV score for the fifth week, what's the answer? The average FEV score for the fifth week, the reference group is week five. For the fifth week, what's the value of week one? What's the value of week two? Week three, week four. So what's the answer in terms of the answer would be 6.99. Either one, I'm getting the same numbers here. You see, you notice that? Okay. If I asked you, okay, what for the first week, for the first week, what's the average FEV score for the first week based on these estimates? What's the answer? Well, now you notice week one is one for the first week and zero, you know, one for the first week, zero otherwise. Week two, three, and four is zero. So it's 6.99 plus 2.815, which is what is it, 9.7? That's the, that's the estimate for the first week. So you notice the first week is 9.7, the fifth week is 6.99 on the, on the average. And you can do this for any of the other weeks and you notice they don't change that much for the other weeks because these numbers are all, uh, are very different from, um, uh, from what happens at the fifth week, okay? So um, in any case, um, Notice also that in the coefficient column, all these numbers are essentially the same. 
Notice they're essentially the same. The beta hats, the estimate of the regression coefficients, are all exactly the same, essentially the same. I mean, there's a little difference here, but that's more round off error than anything. You notice everything else is exactly the same. Okay. However, in the standard error part, they're all different, right? Well, why does this happen? The last, why is, why are they getting, why are they different in the last column? Why, why are you getting different standard errors? Why might you expect to get different standard errors? The reason is because you're assuming a different correlation structure in these different situations. And as a result, that could affect whatever standard errors you're getting for any estimates you're trying to estimate. So the different correlation structure could wind up with different standard errors. Okay, that's why. Okay, but now notice that the column in the middle over here, the numbers, as I already said, the numbers are the same. Why is that? Will that always be the case? You're using different correlation structures, R matrices, and there's no G matrix. You're using different correlation structures in each of these cases, and yet the coefficients are exactly the same. Will that always happen for any data set? Now remember, for this data set, it's a balanced data set. Everybody's had five observations, right? There's no unbalanced thing in here, no unbalanced problem. So there's no missing data or anything like that. Now, it turns out that one can actually show mathematically that when you have unbalanced data, uh, when you have balanced data, that's what's going to happen. These, these things will be the same. It won't change. And, and more generally, the betas from different correlation structures won't change much, if they ch even if they change at all. For balanced data, for unbalanced data, however, these things could be very different depending upon the correlation structure. So what we see here for the balanced data doesn't show up for the unbalanced data. Somewhere in my notes, somewhere else in the notes, I got it somewhere, I'll show you. Here's for the unbalanced data. Look at this. See these estimates? They're not exactly the same. Not only are the standard errors different, but for compound symmetric and AR1, this is for the unbalanced data. I'm just skipping some slides just to show you that they're not exactly 2.8027, 2.7. They're not that much different, but they're different. So when you have unbalanced data, there's no guarantee that either the coefficients or the standard error is going to be the same. Well, what you're worried about the most is the standard errors because that could affect um, uh, that could affect the test of hypothesis. Anyhow, go back to this. Uh, Okay, so without empirical, so we saw this. Okay, so um, let's go on here. Now, this is a very busy table here, but um, and I should have blown it up more than I have, but I want, want to show you something. This table, if we look at the heading, just bear with me here. I'll try to help you walk through it. I don't know if you can see it way back there, but it says here, Edited output based on the FB data for different marginal models without the empirical standard error option using Remal in the SAS mix procedure. So I use Remal, which is what most people are going to do, and this is using this is without the empirical option. And it turns out that if you actually look at these numbers for these in column one, what I've put in column one is exactly the same information I have here. Same information. I just put it in this table. Okay. Now, look at column three. I don't know if you can see how well you can see this. Look at column three. Now, column three has information about the correlation structure based on the model that you ran. Okay. So the first model was assuming independence. So you're assuming that the entire correlation structure is independent, and you're assuming there's a variance. And that's the estimate of the variance, turns out. That's what comes out, okay, for assuming independence. But look at the second one. I don't know if you can, how well you can see it. Now, I, I can't really figure out how to blow this up. I should have, but I didn't do it. Can you see this number in here? 
Anybody see what this number is? 0.5565. This number is, the one next to it, 0 0.5565, 0 0.5565. All these are the same. This is model-based compound symmetric. Why are they all the same? Why are they all the same? These are, the, these are actually, I'm writing the variance structure as a product of sigma squared times the correlation structure. So this is the correlation structure that corresponds. Why, why are all the correlations the same? Compound symmetric, right? That's what I did here, compound symmetric. If I fit a compound, if I make that the correlation structure and I don't do anything to adjust or anything like that, my correlation estimates are all going to be the same. That's what I'm assuming is the estimate. That's what I'll get. Okay, what about the next one, AR1? Can you see these numbers? First one is 0.5835, not 0.5565, and the second one is 0.3405. Can you see that? Well, you, you have your computer in front, you can see that. So, okay. Now that's not exchangeable, okay? Now, you notice that the model base thing, this is for, this is for AR1. AR1 is autoregressive one, what does that mean about the correlation structure? Rho, rho square, rho cube, and so on, right? So if rho, if the estimated correlation between the first and the second is 0.5835, what should be the, estim the estimate of the correlation between the first and the third? The square of 0.5835, right? Rho square. Well, if I square it, I get 0.3405. That's why those numbers are there because they correspond to the assumption I made about the autoregressive structure. And what about the last one, unstructured? You notice the last one, unstructured? What about that? All the correlations are different. Why are they different? Because that's what you mean by unstructured. So you get what you ask for, okay, in a, in a sense. And it doesn't seem to make a difference about um, the overall test. Now, what about the column in the middle? column in the middle, okay? Notice that, for example, in the column in the middle, you notice it says there are actually two test statistics for each choice of R. There's one here, a 24.50, and there's one here, 97.79, okay? What's the 24.50? Well, go back to this slide. You see the 24.50? What was that testing? What was that testing? You remember what it was testing? It was testing whether all five averages were all equal to each other over the five weeks. I mean, all 40, all the average of the 40 subjects over the five weeks were equal. That was what was being tested. And for, um, for when you assume independence, everything's independent, you get an F of 24.50. When you assume it's compound symmetric, you get a 55.26. You get different answers, slightly different answers, but they were all highly significant. Well, there's another test here. It says contrast. And it says 1 and 195. What's being tested here? What's being tested here? Is this the second, is this answering the second question? What was the second question? Second question is, which subjects are affected by the, by the pollution episode more than other subjects? That was the second question. Is this answering that question? The reason why the answer is no, the answer is no. Can anybody tell me why it's not answering that question? Because it's a single test statistic. So it's not testing, it's not distinguishing one subject from another. It's just giving you some overall answer about some question. What do you think is being tested? Whether the average of week one is significantly different from the average of the other four weeks. Significant test. Whether the average score of week one is significantly different from the average of the other four, the other four weeks. That's what's being tested. And the reason why degrees of freedom is one is because you're doing a single test. You're testing a single question about whether it's called a contrast. You're testing 
whether there's a single estimate of effect between one and the other four. So the degrees of freedom in the numerator is one. Where does the 195 come from? Now that's an issue that we have to worry about a little bit with prop miss. Where does the 195 come from? Think about this. How many subjects? 40. How many observations per subject? Five. How many people, how many data set points? 200. So how do you get 195? Subtract five. How do you, where, do you, where does the five come from? The four dummy variables and the intercept, okay? So this is the usual residual degrees of freedom that you would get for any regression model where you take the total number of observations, you subtract the number of parameters in the model. 200 minus 5, 195. That's why they're all 195 over here, okay? That's why they're all 195. Now, it turns out that proc mix allows you, depending upon how you code things, to get or not code things, there's some default options, to actually use different denominated degrees of freedom. And, well, I, I will talk about that. I'm not sure whether I'm going to get to all of that today, but, but there is some issue about why should it be 195? Maybe it should be some other number. But anyhow, that's what I'm telling you. That was what's in table, this table. This is also in chapter 25, which I'm hoping you've read or tried to read. Now, look at the next table. Now, if you look at this table and this table, well, you know, and you can't see very well, they all look the same, right? But it's not because this says edited output with empirical standard error option. So these are the results I would get if I decided to say, well, I'm worried about the choice of the correlation structure. I want to do something to tell the computer to use the empirical option. Now, the way you do that, actually, is somewhere in this thing, I, ha I have this code. You basically, on the first line, when you say proc mix, then you tell the data set. On that first line, you actually write empirical. You go slash empirical. That's an option. And if you write slash empirical, you're going to get the empirical option done. If you leave it out, you're not going to, it's going to be without the empirical. You'll learn about that. But anyhow, this is the empirical. Now, Look at, look at this data. Now, first of all, look at the third column. Look at the third column. Third column, this is empirical. And look at the numbers, for example, in the second box here. See the 0 .5565, 0 .5565? Have you seen those numbers before? They're exactly the same numbers as with the out empirical. Okay, why? Because what you're doing is, you're, not a, you're still assuming the correlation structure for this thing is compound symmetric. You're just adjusting the standard error. You're not adjusting the correlation structure. You're saying, well, maybe that correlation structure is wrong. I'm going to adjust something for the fact that it might be wrong. But that's the correlation structure I'm assuming, so I'm, I'm getting the same answer. And this, I'm getting the same answer for AR1 and the same answer for unstructured. So that's not going to change. What's going to change are the standard errors. Now, you notice that, um, let's look at the standard error for the compound symmetric over here. Compound symmetric, you see 0 0.2418, 0 0.2514 over here. Look at 0 0.2590, 0 0.24. Notice that this set of numbers, ah, this set of numbers, and this set of numbers are different, right? So that's what's being adjusted. What's being adjusted when you use the empirical is the standard error, okay? That's what's being adjusted, okay? Now, something interesting happened here, something a little bit weird, you might say, happened here, okay? Now, you notice that the betas never changed. These betas were the same whether I used the empirical or the um, without, uh, the empirical or without the empirical. But look at the standard errors. You notice that Previously, the standard errors, depending upon what correlation structure, what our R matrix I use, were all different. What happened here? What happened here? Can you, anybody figure out what this is saying? It says no matter what correlation structure, no matter what R matrix I use, I get the same set of standard errors. If I adjust the standard errors, 
for the choice of the, of the R matrix, I get exactly the same standard errors. And I have the exact same estimate, so I'm going to get exactly the same decisions made about whether it's significant or not. Okay? That's what happened here. Okay? Now, what kind of a question might you have about that? The kind of question you might have is, will that always happen? In other words, will it always happen when you adjust for the correlation structure using the empirical option that the standard error is, no matter what correlation structure you use, is going to be exactly the same? What do you think the answer is? In general, no. It's not going to be the same. Why are they the same here? The reason why they're the same here is because it's balanced data. Another reason why they're the same here is because it's a linear model. I think it may not even be the same if it's a logistic model for correlated data. So it's not always going to happen. You see, it looks like if, if you were worried about your choice of the correlation structure, it looks like you can make your decision about what's going on or whether there's a significant effect of week or even a significant difference between week one and the other four weeks. It wouldn't matter what correlation. You're getting exactly the same results. That's what you get here for the balanced data set. And that's fine for that data set. But it won't generally happen. You could get different answers. It's possible that you might not get significance for either the F statistic or the contrast statement if you actually had unbalanced data. And that's actually what happens because in, the, in this um, uh, presentation, uh, um, slide presentation, I have a slide for the unbalanced data where they're all different. So you can look, look that up, but I'm, not, I'm just telling you that right now. So it turns out, in a sense, we were, we were lucky. Well, I don't know if we were lucky. This happened because it was, it was a balanced data set, and so it's not going to make any difference. If it's unbalanced, anything can happen. These can change, the estimates can change, and the standard errors can change, and so it may matter. In fact, you might get significance for AR1 and not significance for compound symmetric, when in this case it didn't matter. I get exactly the same conclusion. Well, if you've got a project where you've got the same number of observations per subject, you're going to be in a more fortunate situation. If you've got different numbers per subject or un unbalanced data set, then you're going to have to worry about this more. Because if you can get a different answer, a decision about significance or not, or what's important or not, depending on which correlation structure you use, what correlation structure are you going to use? Well, you might use the one that you think makes most sense, but there may be several that make most sense. So anyhow, get what I'm saying? So that's OK. Now, now here's. Another thing, okay, this is now the results. I just dealt with all the marginal models for the FEV data set. Now I want to talk about the random effects models. There were two of them, okay? So now I want to talk about that, okay? So look at the model that's over here, model two. What is this, how does this model differ from the other models that I had on the previous pages? It's a model that has a random Intercept, right? See that? That BI0. It's a random intercept. Okay? So when I fit this model, and this is using the um, this is using the um, complete data and the without the um, without the empirical option. When I use the complete data without the empirical option, this is what I get when I fit this model. Um, and this is what I get um, for sigma naught square and sigma square. Now, what, what, what I didn't show you here is the correlation structure. But could you tell me, based on what I gave you here, what the correlation structure is? What's the correlation structure for this model? Do you know what it is, based on what I said at the beginning of class? This is a random effects model with a single random intercept. When you have a random effects model with a single random intercept, and you're assuming the error matrix, as the, the error term, as prof. Mix does, is independent, what's the correlation structure? Compound, exchangeable, or it's a, it's a compound symmetric uh, variance covariance matrix, right? That's what it is. 
In order, to, in order to figure out what that compound symmetric variance, all you need to know is the variance for the G matrix and the variance for the R matrix. Variance for the G matrix is just one scalar for the G matrix and for the R matrix, it's sigma square. So you get these two and you, can, you could actually put together the uh, covariance structure, but the computer will print it out. So you can get this information, okay? Now what's this stuff at the bottom? What's this? What's at the bottom? You didn't see this when I ran the marginal models, but you're seeing that here. What's this stuff? And it's got inter intercept subject one, intercept subject two, intercept subject 40. And it's got estimates of coefficients, standard error, denominated degrees of freedom, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, can you tell me what, it, what this is? What is it? Well, there's 40 subjects. You have a random intercept. So this is the estimated random intercepts for each 40 subject, each of the 40 subjects using this model too. That's what it is, okay? That's what you're getting. So you're getting 40 different B statistics, B estimates, and you're getting whether they're significant or not, okay? So that's for model two, okay? Now, um, uh, now if you remember from last week, um, I think, I'm not sure, but the, in, or the recording, one thing I said about this model is, this is a random effects model, but it's a random effects model that doesn't answer the question that's the second question. This gives you some information for each of the 40 subjects, but it doesn't give you the information that answers the second question. The second question is whether, uh, which individual has been affected uh, by the pollution alert in terms of what's going on in week one versus the average of the other four. This is not doing that. This is not doing that. This is doing something else. What is it doing? Let's see if I got it here. No, nope, I don't have it here. I think I, there was an earlier slide that it was in the previous notes that talked about this. The earlier slide basically said what this is doing is just telling you whether a given individual, like in a subject two, whether subject two, whether subject two's average FEV score differs from the average FEV score for everybody. Subjects two's, like this one, 1.93 or the, the, the 0, 0, 0. This says for subject two, their average FEV score over the five weeks, over all five weeks, differs from the average FEV score over all five weeks for all 40 subjects. Does that answer the second question? For average for all five weeks over the, uh, the average for a subject over the, uh, compared to the average for everybody. Well, that's not comparing what's going on in the first versus the other four. That's looking at the average for one person versus the overall average. So that's not answering the question. I don't know if, I mean, we talked about, it was, it was in the um, previous thing, but this, this thing doesn't answer the question, is what I'm saying. So you can run this model, but it's not gonna answer your question. So there are random effects models, and there are random effects models. Which one you use? This one you can run, but it's not gonna tell you. Well, here's the other one. Here's the other one. Second random effects model. This is where there were two random effects. One random effect was the intercept, and the other random effect was defined by a second variable which took on the value zero if you're in the first week and ones if you're in the other four weeks. And from this choice, one could show, and I did this in, in, the, previous, um, uh, in, in the previous slide presentation with the linear models, you can show that this choice of two random effects, an intercept and a random slope, um, for uh, would define this this way, does allow you to answer the question: which persons were more affected by the pollution alert than other per or other persons? Now you notice that when you run this model, you not only get estimates of um, the, the the betas and their standard errors and all of that. Uh, but you also get two estimates here for each subject. Why do you get two estimates? What's, 
See the minus 0.252 and the minus 0.346, what are they? What's minus 0.252? What's that? The estimate of the random intercept for the first subject. And what's minus 0.346? The estimate of the random, of, not the random, the estimate of the slope for the first subject. All right, that's what it's doing. Okay. Now it turns out of these two random effects, it's this one that one can argue, and I argued that in um, in the chapter and in the previous um, uh, in the previous uh, lecture recording. Argued it's this coefficient, the second one, that allows you to answer the question whether there's a subject was affected negatively, severely, negatively, and significantly severely affected by the pollution alert. Okay, it's the second one, so that's why I put it in red. And you have 40 of these, okay? Now you notice, for example, for this person, subject number two, the, the BI1, which really B21, I is two, B21 is 1.319, and you look at the p-value, it was 0.049, it's a significant at the 5% level, okay? So it looks like, if you just looked at these numbers, that subject two is significantly, has a significant slope, okay? And you might say, therefore, subject two was significantly and negatively affected by the pollution alert. But we already, before the break, saw that subject two actually was positively affected by the, by the uh, subject two's difference between the average difference between week one and the other four was actually better than the average difference. So even though this was significant, it's not a significant negative effect. So that's not gonna do it. Even though, so you can't just look at significance here. So, Let's look at the next slide, just to see what's going on. Now, what I've done here is, on the next slide, I haven't done it for everybody. You notice it says subject one, subject two, subject three, goes down to subject 10. See that? You following me? I hope, okay. Subject, okay. So for subject one, so look, look at subject, um, subject two. You see the point nine oh nine six and the point five five seven nine. See the um, subject two, 0.910. See that 0.910 and the 0.558. That's just rounded off. Oh, sorry, that's just rounded off numbers. These are these are just rounded off from, to the previous slide. So this information for subject two is exactly the same as what I had on the previous slide for subjects one and two. But I've got other subjects. Now you notice you see that for subject two you see it's 0.0494, and I got a star next to it, and it says significant at the 5% level, as we saw, 0.049, significant at the 5% level. But you notice that, and that was subjects two difference between 2.83, uh, between the average of, of um, the average difference and subject two's difference. But this was not a, this was, was not a, for subject two, this was a positive effect. But well, look at subject three, which I didn't have on the previous slide because I just went on, what I, I only had subjects one and two, I didn't put subjects three. Look at subject three. Subject three is minus 1.5494, 0.0213, that means it's significant at the 5% level, significant, not at the 1% level, but significant at the 5% level. And subject three, we previously saw when I showed you before the break, this person was negatively affected by the pollution alert when you looked at the average difference versus subject three's difference between week one and week four. So subject three gets flagged. So if you look at these 10 subjects, if you look at these 10 subjects, only one of these 10 subjects was significantly, severely, or negatively affected by the pollution alert. All not, the other nine weren't. Okay, now that's the first 10. What about the other 30? Well, I didn't produce that here. I didn't produce that here on the, on the slide, but you can do that. In fact, one of the things you're gonna be doing for homework, not next week, but the week afterwards, 
This whole model was run assuming that the, uh, the reference group was week five. What you're going to have for a homework assignment that's due, I think, not next week, but the week afterwards, was you're going to be asked to run the same data set to answer the same questions, but use week one as the reference group. And you should get the same conclusions. You should get the same conclusions. That is, for, for persons one through 10, the only person that should have been affected severely negatively is person three. But you're going to have a homework assignment where you're going to be asked to use proc mix and to run this model, but where your reference group is not week five, it's week one. So how do you do that? Well, you have to figure that out. And we'll talk about that a little bit more before we get to it. But uh, it's not due for next week. But that's something. And by the time you finish with that assignment, you're going to get some experience using proc mix. You know, that's what I want you to do. And that's, that's the key assignment that you have to turn in, because that's where I want to see how you're doing with that. I want to see what you did with that. So anyhow, um, so all of this on this slide is a, 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 a verbal description of what I just described. I said, I said from the table, this previous table, only subject three has a Z1 estimated random effect that is significantly different from zero. These results indicate that only subject three out of the first 10 subjects was significantly more adversely affected by the pollution episode than the average subject. That was the question. Okay. So I don't know, is this, is, is this, is this heavy? I don't know whether this is heavy. Is this heavy duty stuff? I'm not sure. but. Um, there are other things we can, we can do. But anyhow, that's what we did. Now, I did say I analyzed the data for unbalanced data. And what I did is I dropped some subjects from the data and did it for unbalanced. Well, I'm going to skip that uh, analysis or the results for now, other than to show you things changed. As I showed you this before, the estimates and the standard errors were different. Okay, And then this is how things changed. But OK, now, so. Um, what we have now done up to this point, what we've now done up to this point, now it's five to five, I still have the time. What, we, what we've now done was to, uh, at this point, we've shown that if you want to estimate subject-specific effects, which we needed to do, that was the second question for the FEV data, you have to use a random effects model. That's one reason for using a random effects model. You want to say something about individual subjects. If you don't put in subject-specific effects, you can't say anything about subjects, individual subjects. That's one reason. It's not the only reason. Okay? There are other reasons. And the second reason has to do with your homework assignment for next week. And actually, it probably had to do with the homework assignment for this week. You want to use a correlation structure not available as a choice in the computer package you are using as for, repeated, as for a repeated ANOVA approach. Now, I need to explain that. What's, what's going on? Something happening? No? OK. 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 So now, um, forget about the missing data. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, uh, the next example, the next example, the main example, was a shoulder flexion example, which was the thing I was going to talk about. But before we do that, this is what I'm going to do in the next few minutes here, and I'm not going to finish it. Um, Let's talk about contrast and estimate statements for proc mixed. How do you do these tests? How do you get these estimates? Okay. Now, I've got some statements over here, and I've got to, I've got to walk you through this. And I, I don't have enough time between now and 20 up to 5 to walk you through everything, but we're going to start. First thing it says, you do not need a contrast statement to test for an overall effect of a single variable, spelled wrong, listed as a fixed effect in the model statement. This includes class variables and their interactions as long as they are listed in the model statement. Tests are automatically output for each individual variable in the model. Okay, that's the first thing. Now, to illustrate that, again, I'm not sure if you can see this, so I'm going to show the next one here. Okay, well, actually, I'm going to show you, okay, I've skipped a couple of slides, but look at look at this slide over here, this this part 
this um, code at the top. This is ProcMix, it's for the FEV data set. Same thing as before, it says model FEV week slash S, it says estimate week one minus 0.25 minus 0.25 minus 0.25, minus 0.25. it's got four of them, okay? Now, first thing I want you to know about this is that this model, it's got an estimate statement. But the, S, the purpose of the estimate statement is to test whether week one is different from the average of the other four weeks. But you don't need, if, if I left the statement out and I just ran the, the first three lines and I put run, I would have a chunk test for the significance of the week, of the week variable. In fact, somewhere in the output, I have it here somewhere, skipping it, somewhere in there. You see this 24.50? See that 24.50? Have you seen that number before? I showed it to you before when we ran, and this is for the independence model. We assumed everything was independent. This is the chunk test. Four degrees of freedom in the numerator, 195 in the denominator. Four in the numerator, 195 in the denominator. Okay, 24.5. It's the chunk test whether there's a significant difference. For, and what I'm basically saying here is that I could have gotten this chunk. If I left off the statement, I'd still get the chunk test. I don't need a contrast statement. Estimate statements don't even give you a test. Estimate statements give you an estimate, don't necessarily give you a test. If you want to get a test, you need a contrast statement. But without a contrast statement here, I can still get the, the test for whether there's a significant difference in the five weeks, because that's what the first statement said. You do not need a contrast statement to test for an overall effect of a single variable listed as a fixed effect in the model statement. In this example, the single variable is weak that's listed as a class variable. That's the only variable that's in the model. So because of that, whoops, because of that, um, this includes class variables and their interactions as long as they are listed in the model. In this case, there weren't any interactions. Tests are automatically output for each individual variable in the model. So the answer for the test for week was 24.50. That was the chunk test. Now, however, if you got a more complicated situation that I'm going to talk about here, then it's a little more, more complicated. That's when you have to use a contrast statement. Now, look at this. Here's a model. Okay. Here's a, it's, it's a linear model, right? It's a linear model. Okay. It has, uh, now, if you think about this, this is a linear model. I, even though I have some variables here that are denoted as Z, what kind of a model is this? Look at what I've written over here. Is it a marginal model or a random effects model, based on what I've written? Random effects or a marginal model? How do you know that it's a marginal model? Because the coefficients of all these variables are written in Greek letters. That means you're talking about fixed effects. If I had had a B or something next to this, then I'd be talking about random effects. This is a marginal model where there are two kinds of fixed effects, X's and Z's, that's what I'm saying. Get that? That's what I'm saying. It's a more, so it's a little confusing. I didn't, should have changed it to, not to Z, to some other letter, but I didn't. Okay. So suppose in this model, this model, you wanted to test for this model whether you wanted to do a chunk test for the Z's, given the X's in the model. Chunk test for the Z's, given the X's in the model, okay? How would you do it if you were using logistic regression? How would you do it if you're using logistic regression? Or even linear regression, but how would you do it if you're using logistic regression? You'd fit two models, right? What kind of a test would it be called? Likelihood, Likelihood ratio test. You'd fit two models. The full model, right, which is this model, and the reduced model under the null hypothesis that all the gammas, the coefficients of the terms you want to test, are all equal to zero. You fit those two models, right? And you get a likelihood ratio statistic subtracting these two minus two log r values. And how many degrees of freedom would it be if there are q of these z's in the model? q could be six, q could be 10. Degrees of freedom would be q for the test. It would be a chi-score test with q degrees of freedom. 
Okay. Now, it turns out that when you're using crop mix, um, there's a way to do that where you don't have to do a likelihood ratio test. And this could be whether you have cor correlated, um, you have uh, a, a, um, an R matrix in there, or G matrix, or whatever. But in any case, when you're using crop mix, notice what I've written over here. It says contrast Z chunk. And then I've written Z11, comma, Z21, comma, Z31, comma, dot, 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 ZQ1, semicolon run. This is the way I can do that test using proc mixed. What have I done? I've said, okay, I've said, look, for e, I've, what I want to test are the coefficients of the Z variables, not the X variables. So the only, the only variables I want to list in this contrast statement now, the Z chunk is just my way of telling myself that's what I'm doing. I could have put my name there, David's chunk test, or something like that, or Dr. K's chunk test, Z chunk. But I'm putting now Z1, the name of the variable Z1, that's how it was coded, Z11, Z21. Now, what have I done here? What have I done? What I've done is I've listed the variables I want in the test, and I basically put in a number which represents their coefficient in this, in this uh, list of things I want to set equal to zero. The coefficient is one, one, they're all ones, okay? And then what I, the other thing I've done that's new, I don't think you had this in proc logistic, see these commas, commas over here? You gotta put these commas in. Z1, one, comma. Z1, space, one, comma. Z2 space one comma, Z3 space one comma. You put all these commas in between the different Z's, you're doing a chunk test, okay? That's how you do chunk tests, okay? In fact, what if I left the commas off? What if I left the commas off? And I just said contrast Z11, I left Z21, Z31, would I be doing a chunk test? And the answer is no. I'd actually be testing for some linear combination of these Z variables, some linear effect of these Z1 variables, whether they're all equal, this linear sum is equal to zero. That's what I'd be testing. And the commas are needed to do a chunk test. Is there a question? No, here, I'm not sure, okay. So that's how you do chunk tests, okay, roughly, okay. Now, um, so let's look at this. Let's look at this again here. Let's, let's look at, um, now, what I've got here is, again, I've got the FEV data set. I've got different, four different situations, and I want to talk about each one of them to some extent, but I know it's, I'm never going to get finished with it, but I want to talk about the extent I can. Look at the code for week one and the code for week two. This is, you know, I've taken what's here, and I've just blown it up a little bit. Not great, but blown it up a little bit. Now notice that in week in, in code for the one, the class statement says class subject week semicolon. Okay, that's for one. But notice for two, let's see. Now, by the way, it says class model estimate week. Do you see a repeated statement? No. Do you see a random statement? So what's being done? What, what model's being fit? There's no repeated statement, there's no random statement. What's the G matrix? Zero. What's the R matrix? Should have said this earlier. If there's no repeated statement, what's the R matrix? Is it compound symmetric? Is it AR1? There's no, there's no R matrix? It's gotta be, it always has to be an R matrix. What's the R matrix, what's the default R matrix? independence, sigma square i. So if I don't have either a repeat statement or a random statement, I'm just assuming that my 40 observations, you know, uh, 40 subjects, five observations on each kid, they're all independent. I'm just running that just to show you what, I mean, I could have put a repeated or, car, or car, uh, a um, random statement, but I'm just running it just to show you what would happen, just to, uh, to illustrate the estimate and the, um, Contrast statements. Now, you notice I say, I say here um, for one, I say estimate week 
1 minus 0.25 minus 0.25 minus. You notice there's no commas here? Notice that? No commas. What else do you notice? It doesn't say contrast. It says estimate. It doesn't say contrast. It says estimate. So what's being done here? What's minus, what's another way of saying minus 0.25? What's that equal to? Minus a fourth, right? There's a minus a fourth, minus a fourth, minus a fourth, minus a fourth. So this is, this is the first observation, the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. So this is actually dealing with trying to estimate the difference between the first observation and the average of the other four observations. Isn't that what it's saying? This is week one minus, minus 0.25 times week two, minus 0.25 week three, minus 0.25 week four, minus 0.25 week five. That's the difference between them. Week one and the other four. So that's how I could ask the computer to do this estimate, to estimate this difference between week one, and this is not a random, a no random statement, I'm just looking at week one and the average of the other four. So that's how I can do that using this code. Now look at the second code. I am watching the clock here. Look at the second code. The second code is different. Now you notice that in the second code, if you go down to where it says proc mix, you notice there's no class statement, right? No class statement, okay? What have I done up here before I wrote Proc mix. What have I done here? If week one, then w one equal one, e two, w two equal one, else zero. What have I done here? I've defined four dummy variables. Okay. What's the reference group? Week five. Week one. If it's week one, it's one zero. Week two, one zero. So I've left out week five, which is it's, if it's week if it's week five, the the um, W1 is, uh, W1 is 0, W2 is 0, W3 is 0, and W4 is 0, but it's week 5. Okay. Now, what have I done here? I've now taken this new data set, I'm calling it FEV2, and I'm going proc mix data FEV2, and I'm writing model, and instead of saying model, I'm not even, I don't even need subject here because I'm assuming everything's independent. If I wanted to do an AR1 thing, I'd have to put subject in there, but I'm saying model, FEV equal, uh, so I don't need a class statement. W1, W2, W3, W4, what's my model? How does this model compare with this model? Look at those two models. How do they compare? There are two ways of doing the same model. One way is having a class variable and letting the computer define dummy variables with the reference group being week five. And the other is defining the dummy variables specifically yourself. That's what this is. That's what the second one's doing. So you can do it either of two ways. And it's up to you to decide what you want to do. You can do it either of two ways. Okay. Now, so I did the second way. Now look at the estimate. Now I've got an estimate statement here. Now here's where, this is where I, you know, I know I'm going to finish this. Look at the estimate statement here. It says week. It said estimate week. So now, now look at what's written here. She said week one minus 0.25 minus, what's here? Week, what's this? W11, W2 minus 0.25, W3 minus 0.25, and W4 minus 0.25. Now it turns out these two ways of doing it estimate exactly the same contrast. They compare week one with the average of the other four. But if you look at this second one, you're going to say, hey, there's something funny about this. There's something a little weird about this. The second one, you notice this was 1, and then there were 4 minus 0.25s. Now there's a 1, and, and it's not just, you know, I've got W1, W2 in there. But you notice there's only 3 minus 0.25. So what's going on here? Is this a, am I tricking you? Is, it, is this an error? No, it's not an error. These are two ways of doing the same thing. And in order to see that, what you have to realize is that what's being tested here is, you see, the coefficient of W1 is beta 1. 
coefficient of W2 is beta 2. The coefficient of W3 is beta 3. The coefficient of W4 is beta 4. So what's being tested here is beta 1 minus beta 2 plus beta 3 plus beta 4 over 4, or minus 0.25 times the sum of these three. That's what's being tested over here. I only have beta 1, beta 2, beta 3, and beta 4 in here. I don't have beta 5 in here. Okay, you see that? Now, if I do a little algebra, if I think about it, it turns out, what's beta 1? What's beta 1? Well, beta 1 is mu 1. Beta 1 is what happens when you fit this model. And for this model, if the reference group is week 5, beta 1 is the difference between week 1 and week 5. So beta 1 is mu 1 minus mu 5. Beta 2 is mu 2 minus mu 5. Beta th so if I plug these in and do a little algebra, this turns out to be equal to mu 1 minus the average of the other four. So if I do this test or this estimate, and I do this, I'm estimating the same thing. That's what you're going to have to spend a little time demonstrating to yourself, that mu 1 minus the average of the other fi of 5 over 4 is the same thing as beta 1 minus the average of the other three betas over 4. They're equivalent, mathematically. So you, you should check that out just to make sure you see that. And then we'll go on. Next week we'll talk about some of these other things with this thing, and then we'll start talking about some of these other examples, the shoulder flexion example, which you're going to be working on for the next uh, few days, and you have a homework assignment to turn in. Okay? Quarter after. So five minutes early? Or oh, should I use that? No. No. We're done. Okay? So... See you next week. I assume I'll be here next week. Oh, by the way, on Monday, Zach will go over the answers to the homework assignment that was due today. So he's gotten more people to come to his second session. He could get even more if you want to see the answers to that second assignment. Okay?